Okay. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, great. So uh, thank you all uh, for joining us today uh, for the Miami Global Brain Tumor Symposium. It's really an honor uh, to host this. Um, and I wanna say thank you to the Sylvester uh, Comprehensive Cancer Center and the University of Miami uh, Miller School of Medicine for supporting us in, in this lecture uh, symposium series. Uh, it's a privilege to provide uh, education about uh, skull-based surgery and brain tumor surgery approaches, treatment uh, to all those that are interested, whether it be medical students, residents, or attendings. Um, and uh, with that, we'll, we'll start uh, today's lecture. So my name is Michael Ivan. I'm one of the uh, brain tumor and skull-based surgeons here at the University of Miami, and uh, director of the research for the UM Brain Tumor Initiative, um, and also a PI of a brain tumor laboratory that focuses on glioma and schwannomas. Um, and I want to uh, especially thank my co-directors of the course, uh, Dr. Ricardo Comitar, who is a professor and program director of our residency, and also the director of the Brain Tumor Initiative and Surgical Neuro-Oncology, as well as uh, Dr. Morcos, who we'll be talking about later. But he is a professor and co-chairman of our department here in University of Miami and director of the Skull Waste Program. So we still have a lot of people joining us right now. Uh, so just uh, while we wait for everybody else to continue to join us, just to mention a couple words about our department uh, here in Miami. Uh, we have one of the largest neurosurgery departments in the United States with over 25 faculty, um, you know, three residents a year and, and 20 fellows. Uh, specifically, our brain tumor program uh, continues to grow each year and it's been an honor to be a part of that uh, while I've been here for the last four years. Uh, specifically last year, we did over 1,250 cases uh, of just brain tumors alone. And if anybody has any questions of clinical questions at the end of this, they're more than welcome to visit us at our Brain Tumor Initiative website or call us at the, our 1-800 number, 1-800-59-BRAIN. Uh, and although this symposium is happening during the, the COVID um, uh, crisis, uh, this is not a, a symposium that's really focused on that. There's a lot of great webinars going on right now, um, specifically one yesterday at Lenox Hill with Randy uh, COVID in, in the brain, as well as this morning with Mount Sinai was part of uh, their telegram rounds talking about COVID and brain tumors. Um, and so there's a lot of uh, important information. Uh, but if anything, during the pandemic, we've all been able to kind of reach out electronically with telemedicine uh, and these webinars to, to promote education and, and uh, internationally and even learn from each other. Our department um, here obviously is, has not been as hard hit as, as in New York City. Uh, but uh, luckily, but we did shut down. Um, interestingly, below here, you could see our clinic visits from March uh, um, as they go down to almost nothing while we shut down everything uh, during the, the peak. But interestingly, we, we've, we've started to open back up as, as things settle out, and, and we've really been doing that with, because our, our ability to adapt to use telehealth, and we're, we're over 50% now at our capacity of where we were before COVID, and we expect in the last week or two to kind of go back up to 70 or 80% of our clinic ability capacity as well as open the ORs. And, and it's been really uh, a privilege to be part of a department that's willing to kind of openly embrace the telehealth medicine as, as well uh, as, as we did. So this week, uh, you know, the, the talk will be done by Dr. Morcos. And, and during the talk, there's gonna be several time periods where we'll break and have a discussion. We try to make this as interactive as possible. At the bottom of your screen, you'll have a, a question and answer button, and that's really the, the easiest way for you to answer questions. All the panelists will be on live throughout the talk and be able to answer them either immediately or we'll be able to interject and ask Dr. Morcos uh, his opinion, and, and I think he'll be asking us as well. Uh, but to introduce them, we have uh, uh, Simon Hamp, uh, who's coming from Rutgers University and is the director of minimally invasive brain tumor surgery. We have uh, Brad Zechariah coming from Penn State, who is the co-director of neuro-oncology and Director of Brain Tumor and Skull-Based Surgery there, and Randy D'Amico, who's Director of Neurosurgical Services and a Brain Tumor Specialist at Lenox Hill and the Northwell Health System in New York. And so I wanna thank each of these uh, guys for coming uh, today and taking time out of their busy schedule uh, to spend time with us. Um, but without further ado, uh, today uh, we wanna be uh, thankful to have Dr. Morcos as our first keynote speaker of the Miami uh, uh, Symposium. Um, I'm sure he doesn't need an introduction, but for those of you who don't know him, uh, Dr. Morcos is, is a world-recognized leader in vascular and skull-based surgery. Um, he's the co-chair of our department here at the University of Miami, 
and a past president of the Skolway Society and World Federation. Um, but Dr. Moore, Chris, more importantly, is in a rare category of, of a master surgeon and elite mentor for both faculty, residents, uh, and medical students, where he teaches and inspires us all. And, and for me, it's been a privilege to be here uh, working under him for the last uh, four years um, as, I, as I grow my, my school-based skills and, and become a school-based uh, 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 surgeon. I, I cannot think of a better mentor to be learning with. Um, so I want to thank Dr. Morcos for taking out time for his busy schedule uh, to talk with us and also educate the world on skull waste surgery and brain tumor surgery. And before we, we switch over to him, um, you know, just one last plug. This is a weekly conference, and, and I know a lot of you won't be able to stay for the entire thing because you're going back to surgery or whatnot. But uh, next week, we will be in, uh, having hosting Dr. Spetzler, who will be talking about uh, evolution and transpatrosal skull waste surgery. So I invite you all back next week. Um, you can find, the, we'll be sending out a new link and a new meeting number via our Twitter at Brain Miami or uh, visiting the University of Miami Twitter or Instagram or, or myself, my uh, Twitter Instagram, uh, which will be posted the new link tomorrow. So without further ado, uh, I'm gonna hand the reins over to Dr. Morcos. Thank you, Mike, very much. You guys see my slides now? Yeah, that looks Can great. Can you hear me? Marcus. Yes. Great. Thank you, Mike. I'm, I'm really very honored. First of all, I thank you for thinking of this brilliant initiative to do this. Um, and I'm particularly privileged that uh, I was asked to be uh, the first lecturer. So I thought for a topic, I will talk about the orbit and orbital tumors. It's still neurosurgery. I'll quickly go through some anatomy, surgical approaches, techniques, and we'll try to make it as interactive as possible. I thank the panelists, Simon, Randy, and Brad joining us, and of course, you, Mike, and uh, Rick, uh, the co-directors. And again, thank you so much, Mike. Uh, Skull-based surgery is teamwork. You've seen this emblem that Mike just showed you. This is what, we, what we, I called 10 years ago the mobs the multi-specialist multi of the base of the skull. We started this brilliant conference at our center 10 years ago. We do it every Tuesday for two hours. This is a long time ago. This is when it was, we celebrated its first year. We were a small group then. We're about four times the size of people you see here. Uh, and it, it's a wonderful, wonderful educational uh, opportunity. And of course, a service to our complex patients. Um, and uh, we all learn from each other on a weekly and daily basis. So this topic, of course, is a fruit of uh, this collaboration with the entire skull-based team. The orbit, anatomy, surgical approaches, few case examples, and then hopefully we'll open it up for some cases to be led by the panelists and you, the audience, even though we're delighted to see that you're a huge number. Uh, I, I, just to remind you, I really cannot read any Q&A myself uh, while I'm talking, so the panelists will interrupt me whenever they want verbally to ask me a question because I cannot see the questions pop up on my screen. Let's get right into it. Anatomy of the orbit. I refer you to a wonderful paper by Carolina Martins, uh, who worked with I Rotten many years ago talking about that bony anatomy first. And we've got to start there to understand the orbit. Like uh, Al Roten used to say, to put the puzzle together, you really have to study each piece alone. So the orbit, there are seven bones that make up the orbit. The zygomatic bone, maxillary bone, lacrimal, ethmoid, a small portion, the orbital process of the palatine bone, sphenoid bone, and frontal bone. Then of course you can take each bone apart and you must, the, the young people in the audience, the trainees, I highly encourage you to grab a skull and dismantle it and study it bone by bone. Otherwise you truly will never fully understand the surgical approaches that you will be needing to do and you will not understand the relational anatomy. And again, this is, I cannot go into great detail today, but I encourage you to look at this paper, to go to the lab and do 
all this and try to understand where is this lacrimal bone? Why, where, in which bone, between which bone and which bone is it situated? And what surgical approaches will need to go through which bone? Because as you will see, as I develop this talk, this is a 360 degree uh, issue when we discuss orbital lesions. You've got your lateral wall, you've got here the tiny contribution of the palatine bone at the back of the floor, uh, you've got the inferior orbital fissure, you've got the superior orbital fissure, you've got from a dissection of rotten, of course, the contents of the orbit. Now, so for example, what are the uh, seven muscles, levator palpebri, superior rectus, inferior rectus, medial rectus, lateral rectus, superior oblique, inferior oblique, but only five of them make up the annulus of Zinn, and those are these five muscles. And then again, something that every trainee should remember, what goes through the annulus of Zinn and what doesn't go through the annulus of Zinn, a quick mnemonic is LFT, lacrimal branch, frontalis branch of V1, and the trochlear branch. LFT are outside annulus of Zinn, so is the inferior ophthalmic vein. Everything else is within the annulus of Zinn. Beautiful dissection from Roten again, chasing the ophthalmic artery that is starting medial, then under the optic nerve, and then over the optic nerve. And then what does it do? Well, it has medial branches that will form the anterior and posterior ethmoidal arteries. It has lateral branches that will form the lacrimal artery. And of course, the all important retinal artery and the small branches perforating the undersurface of the optic nerve. You have a, a very good view here of the lacrimal branches laterally. You have an excellent view of the anterior and posterior ethmoidal arteries that are of great importance, uh, particularly endonasally, endoscopically, when we enter the medial orbit, or transorbitally when you want to uh, divide those branches for a bloody tumor. And of course, they carry on into the dura, the folks, and of course, the recurrent meningeal artery that comes from the ophthalmic artery. The superior ophthalmic vein, you will see it of some importance in, in some of the cases I will show later, uh, of course, collects medially, but then drains laterally. And this is more detailed dissections from Roten. It's important when you think of the orbit to think of the bulbar compartment the retrobulbar compartment and the apex. And that almost corresponds to the frontal cribriform and planum in the, more, in the midline. And of course, those are the measurements of the entrance of the anterior and posterior ethmoidal arteries and canals. Uh, what pathologies do you see there? That's from one Japanese paper showing uh, the vast variety of pathologies that we can see in the orbit. And we've seen every possible variation here at our institution. We are delighted and very lucky to work with world-class uh, Bascom Palmer Eye Institute and their excellent physicians, and that's where the interaction is. Another way to think, not another way, an additional way to think of the orbit is, of course, orbital lesions, extraconal and intraconal lesions, very important. I would say it's very, similar to thinking of spinal cord lesions. Are they extradural, intradural, extramedullary, or intramedullary, and so forth. And you can see the various ways they can present and the all important concept, medial to optic nerve or lateral to optic nerve. So therefore, how would you approach things? For example, coming from above, you have a choice of going medially, medial to the levator complex, meaning medial to uh, superior rectus and levator palpebri and, uh, and lateral to superior oblique. You can go centrally between levator palpebri and superior rectus, or you can, do, you can go laterally, lateral to that, to those two muscles. But that's not all, of course. That's just the limited neurosurgical view of things, of course, that's why it is a teamwork of a neurosurgeon, oculoplastic, rhinologist, head and neck surgeon, and it is a 360 approach, and you can read for yourselves the various approaches coming around this sector. There are even a variety 
of there is a variety of pure orbital approaches again beyond the domain of this talk there are a variety of skin incisions in and around the orbit even the subciliary incision have about three variations to it whether you go deep to the muscle or through the muscle or under the muscle um, even for approaching sphenoorbital meningiomas you could come up with this whole list of potential approaches um, and terrinal, supraorbital, frontoorbital, zygomatic. So let's talk about some of the common ones. Again, I'm very aware that the audience is made up of very junior people and, and probably very senior people as well. So the senior people will, will, will uh, forgive me for being a bit basic in some of the things I'm going to show. But this is your basic cranioorbital zygomatic, which is like a workhorse for the orbit. This is a subfascial approach. Again, this is from Roten's dissections. Submuscular, temporalis lifted. I like to use the two-piece approach versus the one-piece. This is a full COZ approach. These are the osteotomies taking you back almost to the superior orbit fissure and definitely down to the inferior orbital fissure. This is kind of a little outdated, I would say. This is a so-called spectacle burr hole that gets you partly into the orbit, partly into the intracranial fossa. And of course, you won't understand those approaches until you realize how the sphenoid bone is located in the skull base. And you will not understand how the anterior clinoid is uh, situated unless you understand the optic strut and how to get and that's a view after a COZ, and that's a frontotemporal dural fold, and that's exposure of the cavernous sinus interdurally. I call this a la, la Hakuba dolink, and then you can see your anterior clinon uh, in case that requires to be resected. Many years ago, I described with Ernesto Coscarella and Mustafa Bashkaya little variation to this, how to peel this cavernous sinus and Dolenk had done it this way, I found it easier to, particularly to teach residents and, and fellows to reverse the steps, to peel the dural space, then to cut the frontotemporal dural fold. That's how I normally uh, do it when I'm uh, doing a clinoidectomy or a modified cranioorbital approach. We do this step, which you can see right here in this cadaveric dissection that uh, Ernesto Cascarella in my lab did, and this is now cutting the frontotemporal dural fold. And this is dissection into the orbital contents to, to really facilitate the understanding of that junction, cavernous sinus, superior orbital fissure, orbital contents. Another view in a cadaver and another view in a surgical case of, of that step. Uh, again, a view of the third nerve. Notice that it does have an oculomotor space around it. And this is, after drilling the clinoid, a very good view of the clinoidal segment of the carotid artery. And if you, of course, drill in here, you will enter the sphenoid sinus. Uh, and of course, that's why in surgery, you don't want to coagulate too much in here because you will create a third nerve palsy. Let's get into cases. Uh, um, so let's start with a craniotomy for a recurrent sphenoorbital meningioma. Um, this is a recurrent meningioma, had been done elsewhere. You can see on the MRI the part that is in the orbit and the part that's in the middle fossa and involving the sphenoid bone. Uh, this is the time at which it recurred, the orbital component covered by a mesh, which you can see here. Uh, uh, had grown. And this is, I would say, one of the most common problems we see with sphenoid, sphenoorbital meningiomas is they are not taken out aggressively enough, particularly the orbital component, because we tend to, be, when we are neurosurgeons, we kind of tend to perhaps neglect the orbital component of the lesions, whether we are or are not working with an oculoplastic surgeon. So it's very important to be aggressive, otherwise, this, these recurrences tend to come back uh, over and over again, even for WHO grade one. Here we are trying to keep the orbital fat and the orbit contents uh, uh, on this side of the cotonoid 
and then trying to remove the, the recurrent meningioma. If you can do it as much as you can one piece, it will assure, ensure the fact that you're probably not leaving a large residual. You saw for a second the lateral rectus and near the end. Uh, that's another, that's a lesson I learned over the years. I tend, I used to reconstruct all orbital defect with mesh. And I think that I learned this actually from Bill Caldwell, who, who did notice, like I did, that uh, the proptosis doesn't get better. So I, don't, I usually don't now reconstruct uh, a defect like this in the orbit. Going on to another case. Uh, hey, Doc, can I ask you a question? Yes, yes please. So you had, you had commented about getting oculoplastics involved, and obviously you have a lot of experience and you're very comfortable operating on these alone. Uh, when, when should the rest of us get oculoplastics involved, or when do you get oculoplastics involved? Is there, is there a paradigm? Yeah, good question. Uh, so, I mean, if it is intraconal, uh, for sure, most neurosurgeons, I mean, although they should be, are not very familiar with that anatomy. Right? And if, I mean, it, you know, it's not a turf issue. If neurosurgeons have oculoplastic surgeons in their institution, they should involve them in every cranio orbital case. Why not? We learn from each other. Uh, and that's how I usually do it now. If the, or personally in my practice, if the orbital component is small and predominantly it's intracranial, I usually don't involve them. They're very busy people, but uh, otherwise I do. I'll move on to another case, an orbitocavernous schwannoma. Look at this proptosis and look at the restriction of eye movements. Um, you will see the MRI in a second. Uh, here is the MRI. Not only is it in the orbit, but it's also in the cavernous sinus. You can see at, in the left image there. And it's, of course, intraconal, not extraconal. Uh, the way I approach these, it's pretty standard. I do an extradural anterior clinoidectomy first. Very important to drill this. I usually drill it with, an, with a diamond. Um, then you have to completely decompress the optic nerve before you start manipulating the intraoral contents and how you can lose vision by being too rough on the optic nerve if it is not decompressed. So I'm show you in a second, uh, well, we skipped the optic canal, but here is now the tumor, and uh, it's the V is sped up. Uh, you can see the classic schwannoma. So you deal with the orbital content. When that is done, then you address the sinus component. Here is the link, Hakuba peel. This is foramen rotundum. It's always venous ooze going on there. I usually like to use heavy seal or powder gel foam. I think you will see it in a minute to stop the venous oozing, but you have to stay with it. You have to keep peeling those two layers because from each other, the tumor is on the other side of this layer. Of course, we're using monitoring intraop of the lower, of the nerve three, four, and, and uh, I will decide in a second where to open. After direct stimulation of this area, I decided that this is a relatively bare zone. So now you open that layer of the dura to enter the cavernous sinus, because what is it that we need to do? The orbital component is gone. The cavernous sinus is not gone. We need to connect both compartments, annulus of Zen and superior orbital fissure. You will see in a second, this component of the schwannoma, and there it is. Of course, it's very different from dealing with a fibrous meningioma. The pathology really dictates this. Again, use liberally the FEC and grab hold of the schwannoma and, and work. I like the sucker because non-traumatic, non-sharp edge. And you use traction, counter-traction, and peel it off the cavernous nerves and off the cavernous carotid artery. And when that is done, the cavernous carotid artery in view, I need to make sure I haven't missed any tumor in the superior. So I will put an instrument 
that goes from the cavernous sinus into the intraconal space to make sure uh, I've taken everything and was satisfied that that was done. There is a completed resection. Here is V branch uh, preserved medially and I'm just making sure I haven't missed anything else. A question from the audience. Yes. Uh, in, in these cases, when you get down to the last part of the schwannoma or meningioma, if you find it wrapped around the nerves, what's the threshold there um, to stop and radiate the remaining residual versus to manipulate the nerves and, and keep going? Uh, I would say the pathology dictates it, Mike. In most meningiomas, we will leave residual for sure. Now, the soft ones, you know, I've been surprised with some exceptional songs. You can peel them out complete. Most genomas you can remove if you stay with it and work your way around it. I'm not talking about neurofibromas. I'm talking about well-behaved uh, soft schwannomas. Most of them, most trigeminal schwannomas are resectable completely. Now, if reason you feel you're adding insult or injury to the cranial nerves, certainly you can leave a pee, blow it, and then consider radiosurgery. You know, just another question. You mentioned connecting the cavernous sinus through the annulus is in. And that's, you're doing that specifically to be able to tell if there's any residual, right? You don't actually open the annulus is in, you leave it closed. Oh yeah, of course. No, what I meant is maybe I misspoke. I put a probe, an angled probe to make sure, you know, you haven't left a rim of schwannoma hanging at yeah. the junction. Could you use ultrasound in a situation like that also to take a peek? Something you like could, but you know, it's so, I mean, I, I'm not very good at reading ultrasound yeah. in the orbit. It's going to be messy with the yeah. dematous muscles. You could use an endoscope, of course, similar to the transorbital uh, endoscopy corridor. Uh, I've done that, you know, as endoscope assisted. And Jack, you also mentioned something about uh, monitoring. Um, do you routinely yes. monitor three, four, six, or do you do it selectively on, on these cases? I routinely monitor if I'm going to be in the orbit or the cavernous sinus, yes. There's no reason not to. Our, you know, our techs do it so easily with the electrodes at 3, 4, and 6 anteriorly. Why not now? Unlike a seventh nerve, you know, they fire all the time. So it doesn't mean you're injuring them. I monitor mostly to stimulate the nerve when I'm not sure what nerve I'm on. It's not to listen for an aud audition. Uh, you know, an, uh, a feedback that uh, are you pulling too hard. I'll give you another example of a dermoid tumor. I'll go quickly on this one. Uh, I'll show you a classic dermoid. Uh, I apologize. Here, here it is. You can see it there. You can see it on T1. You can see the fat content. There it is on CT scan, classic dermoid, uh, cavernous sinus and orbit, uh, very, fairly easy to remove. You may have to leave a capsule. I'm not going to go through the whole step. It is a cranial orbital again. Uh, very important to drill, unlock the superior orbital fissure so you can peel the interdural the, to do the dolling hakuba technique. Uh, and here is the peeling. Uh, I, I want to show you this video because, again, for the younger trainees, I want to show you a very good view of V2 at Rotondom. Uh, I will speed up. There it is. You see there is V2 at Rotondom. Uh, often use V2 as your landmark to start the peeling. Um, there is V2. Then you peel, you peel back, you peel back. Then you enter the lesion, and it's going to have classic dermoid stuff in it and it's going to have pieces of hair and it's going to there is a cavernous carotid artery and uh, otherwise it's fairly straightforward he did have a third nerve palsy pre-op and he had it this exactly the same post-op um, lots of variations on orbital approaches here are your pure transorbital endoscopic approaches chris Mo in Seattle should be thanked for this, really, for uh, popularizing this many years ago. There are many multi-portal transorbital uh, endonasal endoscopic approaches. Um, 
my good friend Ted Schwartz, for example, published a few years ago a very nice uh, report of two cases of transorbital endoscopic eyelid approaches. But he was very careful to say, and I use this as a warning, you cannot resect giant lesions with this approach. As he showed in these two cases, you can do it and debulk the orbit, decompress the orbit, debulk a, mini, a, a, nocified, a calcified a intraosseous meningioma like this. You will not be able to achieve truly a completely radical removal of every piece of bone because of the tunnel view you have. But if your goal is an orbital decompression, let's say in an elderly person, certainly very good, very good approach. You can do it one of several ways through the eyelid crease or otherwise. And here are from his paper, pre-op, post-op, for example. Uh, I'll show you another case of mine, a 50 year old. Maybe I'll open it up to the panel. Uh, panelists, uh, this is a 50 year old female with gradual decline in visual acuity on the left eye. And I will point you to this lesion up here. This is sequential CT cuts. Here it is on coronal cuts. Um, here it is on MRI. This is flare. This is T2. This is a T2 here. You can see that you can see here in relation to the optic nerve. And I point your attention to T1 without GAD and T1 with GAD. Uh, Mike or, or any of the panelists, I don't know, Mike, you, you direct it. Who, who would like to make, give an opinion here? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, Brad, any thoughts? Well, on first that? of all, what do you think it is? How should we approach it? I mean, this looks largely, um, it looks to be extra conal there and obviously looks medial to the optic nerve. So I think either maybe an approach, either an endoscopic and a nasal approach, or maybe through like a medial candotomy um, to get to this. Um, coronal yeah. would be nice, but that's kind of my initial thoughts. Um, I'm, uh, Randy, sorry, I had muted my own laptop with one of the video. I may have missed the beginning of what you said. What was your uh, advice? Yeah, again, I think this is looks extra conal, medial to the optic nerve. You're going to take an approach that, that, that brings you medially either an endonasal or something through maybe a medial canthotomy. Um, the enhancement yeah. maybe suggests something like, like an amangioma. Um, you, you, you think it's a meningioma? Hemangioma. Hemangioma, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I don't have the video of this case, but I have a video of a very similar case. It is, well, yeah, I, I, call, I still call them cavernous angiomas, hemangiomas. It has various nomenclature. I completely agree with you. Endonasal is perfect for this. Here is a view, of course, with our wonderful rhinologists. So that's uh, our, whole, our whole endoscopy endonasal program, of course, is uh, thanks a lot to our very talented rhinologists with whom we work daily. Uh, you open the periorbita here. You go between inferior rectus and uh, superior rectus. You may have to coagulate the orbital fat to get it out of the way. And here is inferior rectus. You have to go between the two muscles. And the key is with these cavernomas, don't take it piecemeal. Once you grab it, you don't let go of it. Here I am grabbing it and I'm doing again traction, counter traction. You may have to cut with, micros, with endoscopic scissors, whatever it is. Do not cut through it. It will be very hard to chase the pieces. Uh, and that's a classic cavernoma of the orbit at the orbital apex. And you make sure that you got it all out by looking at the surface of it. And then to reconstruct, there is no CSF leak here. Uh, we like to use alloderm at our shop here. And uh, the post-op is... Uh, it's a gross total resection. Um, Again, a comment from the from the audience, you know, and, and I think it all depends on the symptom, symptom <coughs> the symptoms that are ongoing here. But you know, gamma knife versus surgery for for these um, uh, kind of lesions. Oh, I don't know. I, I'm not very excited about gamma knife at the orbital apex, and certainly not for a cavernous angioma. I mean, yeah. as you know, our uh, 
the, the tolerance to, to, the, to the dose needed, and number, that's number one. Number two, uh, I'm not convinced that it is effective on, on cavernous angiomas. Uh, another very similar example, and I would say that's the second most common lesion you may want to do an endonasal approach at the orbital apex is this, and this is a schwannoma. Not, it's an intraconal schwannoma. Again, I selected in this case endonasal approach. This is the left side, just to show you a little bit how the pathology, it's exact same approach, but of course it's a schwannoma typical appearance. Again, I would say the same, same advice I have, if, unless it's very large, try <laughs> to keep it as one piece. Uh, sorry, I missed it. So once you have it, just try to keep it all one piece and use traction, counter traction. And then of course, inspect, make sure you haven't missed any other uh, pieces. Jacques, is there a size where you would say it's, you know, it's obviously too big to go and the nasal and, and which pr approach would you switch to? to get yeah. Like that? Well, I would say, I would say Randy, as long as it is completely medial to the optic nerve, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy going pure endonasal. Once we start becoming above optic nerve or under the optic nerve going laterally, uh, much safer to, to come from above. Um, now you could also consider transorbital endo, endoscopic. I just don't have as much experience with that as I do with, with the other superior approach. Um, an unusual but often essential role for the neurosurgeon in the orbit is this. Uh, now they're rare. I'm going to skip through those slides quickly, but carotid cavernous fistulae, now that's my, my vascular hat speaking here, but uh, carotid cavernous fistulae that the, our endovascular colleagues for some reason cannot get access to treat them. And if all, I'm going to skip, this is an old series we, we published with very good results, nine, nine out of 10 cases. And this is a technique uh, of entering the skin crease to cannulate an arterialized superior ophthalmic vein. And often, not often, I would, no, I'm sorry, not often, rarely, that is the only way to, to get to the CCF after, in spite of the very good endovascular techniques we have, sometimes we're called upon to do this. Now, again, I don't know, it would be interesting to poll the audience how many oculoplastic surgeons in their institutions do this, uh, we've tended to do this at our place because it's kind of vascular. And uh, so that's what we do. I, I like to use a four French uh, a cook system to cannulate it. And then our colleagues in endovascular will put onyx or coils. So please remember that. That's, what, that's one reason certainly neurosurgeons need to, do, need to know some orbital anatomy for something like this. And then these are some results I'm going to skip. Good cosmetic results. I'm going to skip the video. Uh, and I also remind you, not all orbital lumps are tumors. So this is an 18-year-old with a left eyelid lesion. He was being bothered by it, went to a plastic surgeon. Um, you can see the bulge there. Uh, amazingly, he operated on him with no scans, but he was obviously very skilled to avoid popping this huge arterialized uh, superior ophthalmic vein. And no, it's not a CCF. It turned out to be an AVM, a parietal AVM with a rather unusual drainage, which I will show you, they're rare. This is AVM. Look, look how it's draining way into the orbit. And that's how this AVM was discovered. So I, I took the AVM out and, and, and I'm going to skip that. And the, and the, the vein is what became, of course, uh, venous, not arterialized. Another question that comes up, we all think of intrinsic lesions into the optic nerve are inoperable. We had a recent case. I'm going to skip through some of the slides. A lady who suddenly lost vision in the right eye. And I'll ask my panelists here. I'll show you the scan in a second. Her vision is 2300. Sudden loss of vision down to this from 2020. 
uh, diffuse pallor. This is all examined by the Baskin Palmer neuroophthalmologist. It's here. Here is the lesion. Here is the lesion pre GAD. Not much change post GAD. Um, maybe Simon. Simon, you want to handle this one? So, young woman um, with sudden visual loss, very poor with this. I guess, I don't know, what would you call it? Chiasm, orbital apex? Well, how would you call this one? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it definitely looks like it's traveling into the chiasm there. I think on E and F, it really looks like the chiasm is thickened. So a component of it is pre-chiasmatic and then it seems to be blending into the chiasm itself. So some type of intrinsic tumor would be the guess, like an optic glioma. Yes, I, I agree with you. That's what I thought. I was... I thought, boy, that's, that's bad news for her. So we went in, we thought, well, we at least need to get a biopsy and decompress it. Uh, look, I'm sorry, I should have shown you these images too. Um, and uh, this is, of course, the differential diagnosis. And look, at, look what we found at surgery. Um, it's a cavernoma mm -hmm. of the optic nerve. But look at the very nice, uh, I'm gonna mute this because it's narrated. Uh, look at the view. This view here, uh, classic cavernoma. I looked at it, I said, that's it, I'm going to blind this patient, but she's very poor already. So I took my time and took it out of the optic nerve and chiasm. And at the end, uh, that's a completed resection with a huge cavitation into the optic nerve. I said, that's it, she's waking up completely blind. Look at the, at the optic nerve what, and the chiasm, what's left of it. Remarkably, this is cavernoma, remarkably 20-30 vision. So this is really a warning. I mean, these, this is a teaching case. Don't give up on these cases, particularly when the pathology is benign. And with meticulous resection, you can improve an exam like this. And this is her visual field post-op, her optic disc, an optic nerve, her OCT, and so forth. So, Jacques, obviously, you know, meticul uh, meticulous dissection is key. Understanding the vascularity and the vascular um, supply of the optic nerve is key. But what do you do, uh, you know, after that resection? Do you use propaverin at the end of the case to try to prevent spasm, or do you raise the blood pressure in these patients post-operatively to prevent ischemic injury to the nerve after trauma? Uh, I, in, in this case, I used diluted papaverin. I, I didn't think raising the blood pressure was going to do very much, to be honest, uh, but uh, that's all I did on this case. Yeah. I, I do the same, especially, you know, meningiomas where it's, the nerve is completely encased or, or anything that's, you know, really the nerve is compressed like this one or in the nerve itself. Yeah. I, I'm going to, before I turn I'm over to the one more. Oh, Jacques. sorry. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, go ahead, Yerick. Yeah, um, so, you know, obviously it was good that you came from above, obviously, because you took out, you know, t uh, took out that lesion. But did you think about potentially doing endoscopic endonasal if you were thinking glioma and just a biopsy? Did that cross? Was that one of the options? I, I, I generally, uh, that's a whole other talk. I usually don't approach, in, I mean, I thought it was intrinsic to the chiasm. I usually don't approach those things endonasally. It's very different from a craniopharyngioma or obviously pituitary adenoma. But obviously you can see um, I, got, I got lucky that I came in from above anyway to be able to do this. Uh, I'll, I will, before I, sh I hand over to the panels with a series of cases or answering questions, I'll finish with one slide. I would say, I mean, there are many more lessons I've learned over the years, but I, I'd like, those are important, I think. Inadequate tumor resections around the sphenoid and the bone and the orbit are, are very common in our field, I must say. And then, you know, many of us in the field tend to see residual recurrent that are really, really easy to remove in the first place. So, more, you know, many people tend to resect the intradural portion, but totally ignore the bony involvement. The bony involvement is the easiest part to remove. I've learned over the years to drill the anterior clinoid very liberally, particularly for all clinoidal and tuberculum cell meningiomas, and of course, all orbital apex lesions. Why that is the case? It's a matter of safety. 
to the optic nerve in the canal, matter of exposure. And very important, as Sam El Mefti has shown it many years ago, 40 to 50 percent of meningiomas hide in the optic canal when you don't see them on the MRI. Very important. I, I cannot overstress how important that is. You'll be missing out, you'll be missing uh, uh, some tumor by not drilling the clinoid. And of course, I usually drill it extra durally before removing the tumor. The third lesson I learned is the orbit isn't just from above. There is a 360 degree access to the orbit. And that's why it's important to be part of a team. So Mike, now I have a series of cases to show you guys for you to discuss, or would you like to field questions from the audience first? How would you like to do this? We, ha we have a couple of questions here. Let's just see if we can get through them before uh, we move on. Um, one is, you know, for the CAVMAL, I think uh, particularly, you know, did you do an MRA and angiogram and for these lesions that are close to the circle of Willis in this area, what's the threshold for getting uh, vascular imaging? Well, I, I wouldn't do it for a cavernoma, but if I suspected an arteriovenous malformation or an aneurysm, yes. I wasn't even thinking, to be honest, cavernoma on this case anyway. Um, and then, uh, you know, cautery, uh, is there anything special you do with a bipolar when working uh, either in the orbit or, or through the oral apex? Maybe avoid it completely or uh, just go down to a low setting? If, if, he, if the person means bipolar cautery, no, of course, you cannot avoid it. Uh, often, as a matter of fact, in the orbit, as you know, arteries can retract into the orbital fat and cause hematomas. So no, absolutely, you want perfect hemostasis. You keep it at low current. I, I like to use a specific set of non-stick irrigated disposable bipolars that uh, I like very much for vascular work and, and tough tumor work. Uh, that's what I use, 25 or 30 current. You know, going with that question just for a second, um, you know, you mentioned you like to drill the canal and the clinoid uh, extra durly for the most part. Do you worry about the heat of the drill? Are you obviously using irrigation, but you know, there's, I, from training, I remember stories of the heat of the drill causing blindness. Yeah. Oh, I, I agree with you. You have to be so careful. I, the videos, these videos I showed are not the ones that show the drill I currently use. I'm, I'm not going to mention company's name, but it's a curved drill, low power, covered all the way to the, to the tip of the drill. And it's, uh, and, but you still need irrigation. Uh, absolutely. I don't do those without an assistant irrigating, uh, or unless you use, you know, suction irrigator like the neurotologist. Very, I agree, the heat is your enemy here. And I, you know, the eggshell technique, leaving the shell of the clinoid to be uh, cracked at the end is very important. And then uh, for tuberculum meningiomas, uh, as they kind of, obviously, sometimes they spread over laterally, but if they're very obviously in the middle, do you still drill uh, uh, the, the optic nerve? And if so, how do you choose which side? Uh, very good question. So I usually go from the worst side uh, to, to try to, if, well, you look at the MRI, if there is any eccentricity, I go from the side where it's eccentric, which generally tends to be the worst side. The exception to that, if somebody is already blind, let's say it's a recurrent case, somebody is already blind on one side and is recurring from that side towards the good side, I would come in from the blind side I've often cut a blind optic nerve to be able to remove tumor medial to the good optic nerve of the other side, a kind of similar concept to clipping uh, medially pointing superior facial artery aneurysms or carotid cave aneurysms. You know, we've got a few questions about um, hyperostosis and you know, we've had a few questions about radiation and whatnot for this. You mentioned you drill it away. You don't repair it at this point either, right? You're just, what do you, are you packing fat in there? Are you putting some sort of, uh, you know, material overlaying it? You mean on the orbit? Yeah, when you're coming intracranially, removing maybe the lateral orbital wall or the orbital roof. Yeah, nothing. I, I mean, I only re rebuild the outer skull. And again, I mean, uh, I mentioned him again, uh, uh, Bill Caldwell and I have a very similar experience. We've, we've given similar talks. Uh, we've both learned that if you rebuild 
uh, with a mesh, uh, that proptosis doesn't get better. Now, you could certainly rebuild it with a very convex mesh to prevent uh, herniation of the brain into the orbit. But to be honest, it doesn't seem to be necessary at all. That's what I've learned in more recent years. But what yes, about, for sure, you rebuild the outer skull. What about, uh, you know, everyone's, I think the fear is always pulsatile exophthalmos. Do you see that a lot? I mean, never, never seen it on a permanent basis. Never. I have seen it, I would say, three times on a temporary basis. And the longest one was actually a bishop not too far from here, uh, lasted about four months, but completely went away because of the scarring. I have never had to revise somebody because they have persistent pulsatile exophthalmus. Interesting. And then, uh, you know, you, you quickly went over the, uh, the Hykuba dissection in order to understand the clinoid and the meningo orbital band, but there's a couple of questions here about you know, avoiding uh, cranial nerve injuries while you're doing that dissection. How do you know how to cut the meningo oral band? And I think your technique is, is really, uh, you know, well taken by the residents and early junior faculty. So maybe if you just want to talk about that one more time. Um, okay, so, you know, it's a long topic, but uh, I don't want to take too much time. So first, we need to orient ourselves after we've, we've unlocked the superior orbit of Fisher. And, you know, again, for the younger trainees, they get lost a little bit early on. And that's why it's important to go to the lab, understand what's the greater wing of the sphenoid, what's the lesser wing. Once I've unlocked it, I've identified periorbita. Then I go and find V2. Rotondom is your friend. You find V2 lateral, and then you dissect those two layers. You go in the space between the two layers from rotondom going medially. That takes you into the superior orbital fissure proper. So your vector of dissection is from lateral to medial, from anterior to posterior. Uh, then you will see, I know it's tough to express it in words, then you will see the tip of the clinoid from the middle fossa. That's what I need residents and fellows to understand. If they understand that point, they'll understand the whole surgery. You will see the tip of the anterior clinoid from the middle fossa, then your Frontotempor the, the, the frontotemporal dural fold will be hanging in midair. You can cut it, and then the clinoid is completely uh, exposed to drill. If I may yeah. chime in here, Jacques, this is Walter Jean. Um, there is, um, on that topic, a, a different school of thought, of course. Um, the, the other school of thought is that you're cutting the meningo orbital band to make that peeling easier. So you're doing it A to B. B this school is more B to A. If you cut the band early, you can actually make, do the hakuba a little bit easier because it starts the hakuba for you. So countering uh, thoughts here. The other, the other thing about avoiding injury is that as you cut the band, you follow the contour of the temporal dura. Instead of cutting towards the apex of the orbit or towards the clinoid, you're, cut, uh, you're cutting towards, you're cutting anterior, posterior, lateral, and medial, following the contour of the temporal lobe. I've never had a problem with third nerve with that. Uh, but you, you've made my point, Walter. Love, lo I love to see you here. Fantastic. For experienced people, it makes no difference whatsoever. But trust me, for young residents, you ask them if they haven't done this enough. I, the only reason I switch the steps is to be able to teach the residents. They will understand the anatomy better by flipping the steps. But of course, at your level and experienced levels, you know, the, you might think that what I'm saying makes no sense. It's really for the young, inexperienced surgeon that it helps. Okay, thanks. You want me to throw in cases and you guys discuss, or what would you like to do? I think we have a, a few minutes, uh, so maybe we can get through one or two cases, and then more. Just we'll wanted to jump back. in with a quick question, if that was okay. The uh... It's very uncommon I find myself intentionally going into the cavernous sinus, but obviously there are lesions, meningiomas and such, where there's enough of an intracranial extent that you'll do an operation to remove that and then maybe not travel into the cavernous sinus. Now, these patients are presented with a lot of cranial neuropathies, Jacques. I'm just wondering, what is your counsel to patients in terms of recovery of those neuropathies? And, and I see them in two general forms. Either it's a chronic worsening or sometimes people develop a very acute decompensation very rapidly. 
And does that kind of influence how you counsel the recovery? Yeah. Well, Simon, as you well know, I cannot answer you without talking about what pathology we're talking about. Are you talking meningiomas or in general? Or? Meningioma primarily. Yeah. Um, so uh, chronic uh, ophthalmoparesis due to a meningioma in the cavernous sinus, you're unlikely to make it better with surgery. Now, if it's extreme and you have severe ophthalmoparesis or ophthalmoplegia, this is a, a young patient that may have failed gamma knife. Again, I, I don't have, this is probably another topic, pure cavernous sinus. I have done cavernous sinus exenterations to, to quote unquote save lives, lives, particularly in WHO grade two meningiomas that have failed everything you've thrown on them. But maybe that's not what you're exactly asking about. Uh, I'm very conservative, a quick answer to you, I'm very conservative with intracavernous meningiomas that have minimal uh, ocular disturbance. Uh, I will intentionally leave tumor there. As you know, and I, I do gamma knife as well, as you know, many of them actually, their ophthalmoparesis can get better with radiosurgery, and that would be my first line of, of management. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm fully answering your question. No, that does. That absolutely does. Yeah, I just, it's just a, you know, obviously you don't often see great recovery. And so I'm just wondering kind of how you describe that to the patient in terms of their expectations no. when they go into these operations. Yeah, uh, Tom Origitano had a wonderful, uh, he's, he's always has wonderful uh, things to say. He used to say there is no such thing as a little bit of diplopia. It's, it's like either you're pregnant or you're not pregnant. There is no such thing as little diplopia. Either you have it or you don't, you know? Absolutely. Okay, so, yeah, almost six o'clock, but maybe we have time for one or two cases and then we'll, we'll close it out. Okay, let me show this. Uh, in 2016, this lady presented to me a 39-year-old proptosis and pain in the left eye. Here is her MRI. T2, uh, T1, T1 with GAD on, on these bottom panels. Um, um, oops. Uh, okay, you guys take it away. Whatever, whoever is, would like to say something, tell me your thoughts, tell me your approach or whatever. What, what was the age again, Jack? 39. 39. Yeah, I mean, obviously a tumor in the anterior skull base, eroding the anterior skull base and the medial aspect of the orbit. Uh, you could see the middle rectus being pushed uh, laterally um, and kind of going up in the ethmoid sinuses there. Uh, very anterior in the skull base. Um, uh, it looks like minimal enhancement. Uh, it's hard to know if a lot of that's hematoma or whatnot, but you know, because of the young age, you know, you could think about uh, and it looks like it's pretty well rounded. So I would think of more of a, a slower process, uh, you know, maybe like a JNA, um, but also you can't rule out malignancies as well in the anterior skull base. But I think a, the anterior, an endonasal approach is, is definitely possible. Although if you have a dural defect going this far anterior, it could become a problem. Um, but I think uh, coming endonasal would be, would be a reasonable approach. Any descending, dissenting opinions from the panels? No, I think that sounds like a pretty kind of reasonable kind of walk through this. I mean, CTs are always nice. See what kind of true bony erosion there is. Get, get a sense for the chronicity right. of this. Yes. Um, you know, sinal nasal malignancies also kind of pop into place. It doesn't as avidly enhance as something like you might expect with like a snuck or, or a carcinoma. Uh, but those are things that you think about too. And I agree with the repair issue. This anteriorly basically comes, erodes through the frontal sinus. Here, yes. So I thought it was going to be benign. It's kind of very nice and smooth. I'll, I'll skip through it quickly. We, we did go endonasally. I'm putting this case again to, rem it's a rare pathology, but please always remember it, uh, young people. Juvenile active ossifying fibroma. It can mimic fibrous dysplasia. It is very, it's benign, but very locally aggressive. And I'll demonstrate this. We went in, we, we didn't remove it completely. We left a small piece. This is it six month post-op. 
This is a two and a half years post-op starting to regrow. We should have been more aggressive the first time. So three years post-op uh, recurring. And then a couple of months ago, we brought her back and did a much more radical, same approach, endonasal. Again, uh, as you know, you can reach all the way to the mid-coronal plane of the orbit by going endonasally. And this time, I think we did a much better operation for this young woman. So please, again, the young people in the audience, JAOF, very important, but rare pathology that can mimic other bony lesions. And Mike, maybe I'll show another one. 67 year old, several years of decreased visual acuity, left eye, proptosis, only has hand motion in the left eye. Um, panels, let, let me know, you know, you guys tell us your thoughts, or I don't know if the audience want to chime in. Mike, I don't know if they send yeah, you. There, there's, there's some answers coming in slowly here, so maybe we'll just give them a minute. Yes. Um, maybe I'll just describe as they're answering. This is T2. You can see the lesion right here. This is T1. This is T1 with gadolinium heading, as you can see, through the superior orbit of fissure into the cavernous sinus, into the orbit. It's intraconal, uh, not extraconal. You can see its most anterior extent is here. Uh, some other views right here. Yeah, so we have a couple, couple answers coming in. Uh, meningioma, schwannoma, schwannoma. Uh, approaches are talking about transcranial with a uh, clinoidectomy, transorbital approach, optic nerve uh, schwannoma. Those are those are from the audience. Yeah. Okay. What do you guys think on the panel? What? what? I mean, I, those are my two big guesses. I mean, you see a dumbbell shape like that. Uh, go out of the fishery, you think schwannoma is following a nerve, but uh, a meningioma is not a bad guess uh, along a nerve sheath as well. Um, the question that I, I can't really tell is on the coronal, this looks like it's really inferior to the optic nerve, right? Inferior medially, is that where this is primarily? Uh, well, in its most anterior portion, it's inferomedial to the globe itself right here. Yeah. Um, uh, the nerve is pushed medially. You can see it on axial here. And uh, I can, the panel covers some of my MRIs. So I cannot tell here. I don't I honestly remember. Um, yeah, nerve, nerve is visible. Yeah. And the approach I did, yeah, uh, whoever answered in the audience, I, that I, it's too big f uh, for me to consider a smaller approach. So I chose, uh, you know, modified cranioorbital, Dolenk, Hakuba, transcavernous. We, again, it's a schwannoma. It was a schwannoma. Gross total resection, much easier to do clearly than a meningioma. Did not replace the orbital roof. Intra-op monitoring of three, four, and six. And that's a post-op. Those are really nice cases. But I mean, you know, the anatomy, you need to know your anatomy. Here is the optic nerve straightened out at the end on a post-op day one um, MRI. And so, so did this go through the annulus of Zin then? I mean, obviously it's been expanded and probably eroded, but anything to do in the reconstruction of the muscles at, at the end of the case? Uh, I didn't do anything, uh, Mike, nothing. I mean, I did not disrupt. I, I did the same thing as I showed in my video. I connected the two compartments. I did not open annulus of Zin. I didn't do anything with the muscle. Sure. Uh, I was with my oculoplastic surgeon on this one. He agreed with me. So, you know, Jacques, this is a, a global conference and, and obviously you guys are at a center with amazing resources, right? The infrastructure is unreal. The numbers that Mike presented at the beginning are, are impossible to really replicate in other places. My question is for places that don't have these resources, you know, how do you recommend these surgeons deal with this? Places that don't have monitoring of three, four, and six, you recommend them sending them out. You know, you, it's gonna be very difficult to build a practice like this in some of these places that don't have the resources for those? Well, I mean, it's skull-based surgery. I mean, you're right. You cannot have a full-fledged skull-based center without 
cranial nerve monitoring, I mean, it's unsafe. Uh, you know, it's like, don't, would, you, would, would you allow anybody to do an acoustic neuroma without facial nerve monitoring? I'm not saying it's at the same degree of importance, but, and it's not, a, I, let's be honest, it's not essential to monitor those nerve three, four, and six. I mean, most of the time, you could tell from the anatomy, you know, where things are, it's just helpful. Uh, so I would say if you're at the center where you, you know, whatever you're monitoring uh, personnel, first of all, it's very easy to learn. We, we taught our techs to do three, four, and six. For some reason, it's not done. I don't think it should preclude you from removing a tumor like this, as long as you know your anatomy or you're working with a good oculoplastic uh, surgeon. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think the placement of electrodes is, is very simple. Uh, you know, one of the questions from the audience is, you know, how reliable is that monitoring? And is there anything you do to kind of realize what the threshold is? I mean, I, I know when we work in the CP angle, you always try to find, um, you know, if you can't find seven early on, you always test it on 11 uh, to make sure that it's working. Uh, so in the cavernous sinus, you use a similar approach there to make sure that you're stimulating appropriately. Yeah, I just use high current. I start as high as 0.5 milliampere and then I scale it down. Um, and, you know, you end up being able to stimulate easily at point between 0 0.05 and 0 0.1. Okay, great. Okay, any other questions uh, from the audience? Uh, any, anything else from the panelists? I mean, I think it's already 610. Um, Thanks so much for having us. It's been great. Really yeah, it's unique great. talent and, you know, great to hear from you. Yeah, thank you, uh, of course, Dr. Morcos, for, for this, uh, uh, such a high level insight into these uh, rare tumors that really no, not many people could give us. Uh, we've had a ton of people, over, over 400 people kind of chime in and say thank you and, and give us comments throughout the, the lecture. And so I thank you to them as well, and especially thank to all the, top of the panelists to help us go through everything here today. Again, um, I'm just gonna go back to, to my screen here at the end. Uh, you know, please uh, join us next week. We're gonna have a very similar uh, seminar with a lot of uh, interactive components to it. Uh, try to get as many panelists as we can to also comment. And I'm sure it's gonna be um, equally spectacular as it was today with Dr. Spetzer next week. Uh, we'll be sending out, uh, it'll be a different Zoom meeting number and a link. So please join, follow us on the Twitter and we'll be sending out how to, how to register for next week's conference uh, by tomorrow. And Mike, the biggest thanks go to you for thinking of this and putting it all together. And this is the beginning of a wonderful initiative that you started. Congrats. Thank you. Okay, everybody stay safe. We'll see you next week. See you guys. Thank you.